Hey, good morning. I, I, I love that song. This is the last week for that song, and that song gets me hyped. You know, we were uh, singing uh, in just a minute ago, he is for you, he is for you, he is for you. You know, it's just, I, I don't know what it is, but if it's the enemy, if it's our broken nature, but almost everyone I talk to and meet, it seems like at the core of them somewhere, there's this idea that God is against you, that God just can't wait to condemn you, can't wait to, to, to just judge you. And you know, that is not true. That is not scriptural. That is not evidence of a God. God who sent his son to die for us. That is not a father who created us. I mean, fathers, good fathers love their kids even when they mess up, yes? And if we could get it, I think if we could get it in the core of who we are, that God is for us, it would make all the difference. Like it, it, so often we get discouraged and, and it, we, it pulls us away from God because we think he's not for us. When we get discouraged and we're going through a difficult time, when my kids are going through a difficult, challenging time, that's the time I hope they come to me the most. That's when I want them, when they mess up and they need advice and they need help and, and to get back where, wherever they wanna be, that's when I hope they come to me the most. He is for us, amen? Amen, well, that, that's free. That just is from the song there and just got in my, in my spirit. And uh, excited to see you guys here this morning. Last night uh, in our second Saturday night service, there were 180 of us here last night. And uh, yes, super excited uh, about that and, and excited to see the kids out here this morning. Wasn't that awesome just seeing all those kids? I'm not sure they thought it was awesome, all of them, but, but it was awesome for us to see all of them out here and reciting the word of God. And and we rejoice in that. You know, next Friday, this Friday, um, I don't know how to say it. Next time it's Friday, okay? Um, it's gonna be Good Friday. Uh, for those of you that are, are on the 40-day fast, it's, it's the end is near, yes, right? So if it's sugar or whatever it is, man, it's coming, it's coming. Uh, the end of that is coming. But this Friday, uh, we will be uh, have the Stations of the Cross here available in the sanctuary. Uh, this is in lieu of a Good Friday service. We will have the sanctuary open from noon until 8 p.m. There will be Stations of the Cross opportunities for you to come through, reflect on the last week of Jesus' life. Uh, we will have a station where you'll have the opportunity to take communion uh, and to remember uh, together. And uh, this will be a more solemn uh, time for us, a more somber time for us to come together. In fact, this is the only somber day on the Christian calendar. It's the day we remember the sacrifice uh, of Jesus that he made for us. And so I would encourage you to just come through whenever you're available between noon and 8 p.m. Uh, to come through and take time this Friday to reflect on the Lord. I think it's gonna be a, a good time as we prepare our hearts uh, for Saturday and Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. He is alive, amen? amen. Every time we gather together is a mini Easter when we celebrate his resurrection and next weekend we get the opportunity to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. You know, those kids were waving these palm branches, right? And, and my heart, I saw several of you turn and look to see if you had palm branches and my heart just kind of sunk a little bit. I just wish we all had palm branches, but we just had the kids have the palm branches. But this Sunday is Palm Sunday, that week before Easter, and it's a time to come commemorate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the crowds had begun to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And there were giant crowds following after him. So as Jesus came into Jerusalem that time, riding on a donkey, fulfilling prophecy, the crowds came out and they were waving palm branches off the trees because there were, whoa, praise the Lord, because there were, because there were palm trees close. So they got the branches off and they started waving those. They took their coats off and they laid them on the ground uh, just as, as in honor of Jesus, whom they believed was the Messiah, and they were, there was a ruckus, yes, there was some fervor in the place as these large crowds gathered together, but not everybody was excited to see those large crowds. In fact, the Jewish leaders were just upset by those crowds. They were put off by those crowds because one, the scriptures tell us, and we understand, they were jealous, right? It's like when you're, you know, you're leading and you see somebody else start stepping into that role of leading and people following them instead of following you, then you get a little jealous. Um, we, we, we also know that in their, that part of their motivation was the fact that the Romans had allowed them to continue to, to lead. The, the Romans, uh, they had uh, taken over the area, but they allowed the Jewish leaders to stay in control. They allowed temple worship to continue as long as everything stayed peaceful. 
And so on that day, the Jewish leaders saw these big crowds, they saw this ruckus, and they got a little, they got a little concerned because everybody's starting to follow after Jesus. Everybody's starting to believe in Jesus. They want to keep the peace. They want to keep their positions. They want to keep the status quo right? They want the status quo. They want everything to stay the same. Let's not change anything. And Jesus is threatening to change some things. But there was a reason for that fervor. There was a reason that the people were so excited on Palm Sunday. And that is the story that we are going to get in today. You know, we are looking at love goals and how we can love people. And we want to see Jesus. He's our perfect example. And we see in the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, we see his love on full display. You know, Lazarus, he didn't just like pass out and was just sick and, and, and unconscious for a bit. He was verifiably dead for four days. He was wrapped, his body was wrapped, he was put in the tomb. It was four days later. So when the people saw Lazarus come back from the dead, there was no doubt about what they had seen. And this is why everybody was so worked up on Palm Sunday. Uh, they had seen him come back from the dead. They had seen Lazarus raised. They had seen Jesus do it. And they were convinced. And man, I mean, it created a stir. You can imagine if you saw something, somebody raised from the dead, that it would create a stir in your heart, right? Yes? And, and so Jesus is there, and, and they're worshiping him, and all of these things are happening, but it comes out of Lazarus being raised from the dead. But you know what? As we look at Jesus' story, it's easy to look at that story and to think, you know what? I may never raise anybody from the dead. You may never, I may never raise anybody from the dead. In fact, I say the word may, and you're probably thinking, you don't even have to say may, right? Like, I am not going to raise anybody from the dead. And I've told you, I mean, if you ever have the opportunity, just give it a shot. <laughs> Revival will come out of it, right? I mean, if it happens, you know, if you're ever in the room with somebody, you know, before they've been embalmed, when they pass away, I mean, just, you know, it could just even be quiet to yourself so that, you know, people don't think you're crazy or whatever, but you know, hey God. <laughs> Just checking in. Like, I don't know, you know. But I mean, hey, this is the same God that raised Jesus from the dead, the same spirit is alive in us, right? And, when, and God's still doing all the things that, that we see in the New Testament. So we could raise somebody from the dead. Faith check, <laughs> right? I don't know, right? But even if we never raise somebody from the dead, we can see in this story how Jesus loved the people around Lazarus. We can see people how, how Jesus walked into that situation and demonstrated love. So we don't take this story and say, well, I'll never raise anyone from the dead, so I set it aside. But instead, I look at the story and say, how in the midst of that? Like, what, what, how did that get set up? Like, how did Jesus come into that place to raise Lazarus from the dead? How can I love like Jesus? That's our love goal, amen? So we're going to begin here in John chapter 11 and read the first 16 verses of John chapter 11. And I think this explains itself pretty good as we get into it. It says, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see the world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there, so that you may believe but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. You didn't laugh. <laughs> That's like one of the great jokes and like sarcastic remarks in all of scripture, right? And uh, he's like, Lazarus is dead. Well, let's go back where the Jews are trying to kill us too. We'll all die, right? 
come on, is there any, no, no sarcastic people in the room? I mean, you know, nobody gets Thomas, right? <laughs> I think it's great. Let's pray together. God, we rejoice in who you are. We rejoice in your word. We rejoice that you guide us and lead us, that your spirit is alive in us. We rejoice in the story that we get to tell. It's a story of a God who loves us so much that he sent his only son to die in our place. And God, we choose life. We choose to follow after you. We choose to believe that you are on our side, God, regardless of circumstance. And Lord, we desire to hear your voice, to follow after you. We believe your ways are the best ways. So lead us, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. You know, I've married a, a lot of couples, and prior to uh, performing a marriage ceremony, I always do premarital counseling with them, so I've had an opportunity to sit with so many starry-eyed, in-love couples, just can't wait to get married, try to tell them, you know, uh, that there's going to be some challenges ahead, and they're like, maybe challenges for other people, right? <laughs> but not us, we're in love, you know? And uh, it's so great. And, and so I've, I, I've begun to see uh, very clearly the dynamics that are at play when people fall in love and they're attracted to one another and one of the dynamics that's so strong, I can't believe that you can't see it when you're in love, but you know, love is, is blinding uh, emotion and a factor there. And that is that people are drawn to people that are the opposite of them. You know that I mean, it's so, it's so crazy like to see it. It's like quiet people are drawn to loud people, like drawn to talkers, right? In the relationship, like you're coming in church and every say, you know, one of you talks to me and the other one hopes I don't talk to them right? Like one of them's hugging me. One of them's like, I hope he doesn't hug me, right? It's like you're drawn to, to the opposite. Spenders always find savers, right? And, and it's just like, I'm sitting there and I'm just like, you know, this, you're going to have to deal with this. Oh, we're in love. <laughs> Spenders always find savers, right? And, um, <laughs> oh, where's my list? Because the last one's, you know, planners always find spontaneous people right? And it's like, why does that happen? Like, wouldn't you figure that like people would want to be in line with each other, but they, they admire that trait in the other person, right? It's like, I'm quiet. So I want to find someone that's a talker. Cause I'm not going to tell the waitress that she didn't bring my mashed potatoes, right? Like I need somebody that's going to tell the waitress, you know, that's going to be like, Hey hon, you didn't bring those mashed potatoes, right? Cause one of you in the relationship will just sit there and be like, I probably didn't need those mashed potatoes anyway. <laughs> right? It's probably the Lord, <laughs> you know, it didn't give me my mashed potatoes, right? And, and, and the, 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 the spender, they, they see the, the saver and they're like, oh, I want to be like them. Like I admire them so much. I love them so much because they know how to save and I need to save, right? And the, the planner, they like the spontaneous person because, you know, they recognize the rigidity in their life's a little boring. And then they start dating this person and they're like, hey, you want to go do something? Yeah. And then they have fun and it's like, oh, it's so good right? And then they get married. <laughs> and for a while it's good, okay? And then you sort of enter into this season and, and, and you're like, you know what? I, I, I love that you're a talker, but could you just shut up for just... <laughs> For just a minute, just like a minute. I don't, need, I don't need you to always be quiet, but just a couple hours, if you could just, I don't want to hear the sound of your voice. <laughs> and, the, and, and the spender, you know, who married the saver, and they come to them and they're like, can we, could we buy just one thing fun? Just like one thing that's not in the budget, just one little Amazon purchase so that I know that box is winging its way, you know, and there's just, you know, just like one little thing, you know, and the, the planner who married the spontaneous person, they come and they're like, can we just no surprises for just two weeks, just two weeks. I just need two weeks to just know what's coming next. And this is a process, you know, I mean, Michelle and I are opposite people and we were, and I see this so clearly in my life now, of course I was in love, you know, we got married and I didn't see it as clearly, but uh, I, 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 we get into it. I mean, Michelle, I think she married me because, you know, I'm funny and spontaneous and all that, right? And I married Michelle because she's a planner, right? And she is organized and I admired all those things. But as you enter into that next sort of a stage of marriage, you know, kind of going out of the honeymoon phase into the next phase, that, that it can easily become an emotional, manipulative sort of wrestling match of who's going to take control of the family dynamic, because you know opposites attract and then opposites attack. You might have heard that somewhere along the way, and and you begin to see you know hey I I I really wish you were just a little different. And uh, how are we going to sort this out? And how are we going to get there? And you know all these years later, you know 28 years into marriage, I'm so grateful that 
that Michelle and I are different because we balance each other and, and uh, we found that middle ground and we found that way forward. Like, uh, hey, she, she does need to be a little fun. I do need to be a little serious sometimes and we can find that way forward. But there's part of me that still wants, you know, if you could just think like me sometimes, if you could just be like me sometimes. But, you know, I was wrestling with this in those, in those early years of marriage. And uh, in fact, years, I'm gonna say years because I'm dumb. I've told you before I'm dumb and it takes a while for me to get things. And the Lord... The Lord said something to me very clearly and in this whole process. And I'm gonna, in just a second, I'm gonna share something with you on the screen. And I don't normally share these kinds of things on the screen, okay? But I, I just, this was so impactful in my life. Uh, I remember, I don't know if you've had those moments where you just feel like you know God said something to you very clearly. Like there's other times when you're like, God, where are you? Why don't you say something clearly now like you have before? But there's times when God says something so clearly to you. And I was, I, you know, I was praying, I was struggling. I was, I, I was driving. I remember where I was. And the Lord just so clearly said this to me. He said, you are trying to make Michelle in your image. And I created her to be made in my image. And, and that, yeah, I mean, you know, thanks. That doesn't feel supportive at all. Um, it feels like, you know, you guys are like, whoa, you're terrible. Yeah, I'm broken. Okay. All right. But yes, I mean, I, I was trying to, and, and you know, recognizing, yes, I was trying to make Michelle in my image. I wanted her to think like me. I wanted her to act like me. I wanted her to communicate like me. I wanted her to come over and be in my image. And of course, yes, when God says something that clearly and that directional to you, you, you know, you start trying to process it. And as I began to process that, I started to see how it was not just Michelle, how I wanted my kids to be in my image. I wanted my friends to a certain extent to be in my image. I wanted my coworkers to be in my image. It was kind of like, I mean, I began to see myself, oh, hey, I love you so much. Now can you think like me and communicate like me and feel like me? Can you be like me? And as so often happens, as I began to see that in me, I began to see that in us. And looking around and I see how so often in our interactions with other people around us, we look at them and, and, and we like them and we even love them, but there's a part of us that says, hey, can you just be like me? Like life would be so much easier if you would just communicate like me and think like me and feel like me and do things like me. And we're drawing them into being made in our image. And Jesus, as he comes, he tells us that, that love isn't like that. Love allows people to be who God created them to be. And you know, the apostle Paul describes the dynamics of Jesus' loves in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know, I love 1 Corinthians 13 because we all know it. It's the love chapter, right? This, this starts out with all these love verses and it comes right in the middle of a conversation about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit interacts in the church, right? And I'm just gonna be honest with you. There's nothing that'll stir us up as much as the Holy Spirit moving in our church, right? And, and I think it's great because in the middle of that discussion, Paul says, look, this is how we're supposed to love one another. And 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses four and five, it says this, you, you've heard this, you know this, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others. What, is that, what does that word mean, dishonor? Like, I, I don't think about dishonoring people, right? But what about it in the opposite? What about honoring others, isn't honoring others, doesn't that mean I respect you? I respect who you are. I respect how God made you. I respect how you communicate, how you think. Is that not what it means to honor someone, to respect them? Like if I genuinely respected somebody, I don't go to them and try to change them, right? Like I respect Pastor Sam. I don't go to Pastor Sam and be like, hey, can you just be different? No, I, I, I honor. And it says love honors, does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. And in the Greek, this word self-seeking, it's three words actually that's translated and it literally means to look for myself in others. That I would go to you and I would be like, hey, well, you know, let me find me in you. And how self-serving that is. It is not easily angered. It, does, it keeps no record of wrongs, right? That's the great husband verse right there at the end. It keeps no record of wrongs. You'll get that later. Um, <laughs> you got it now? All right. But to love like Jesus, first and foremost, it means that I'm not looking to change you, shape you into me, 
but I, I, I love you for who you are and who God created you to be. You know, we've talked a lot over the last weeks and, and before about short-term interactions that we have with people. And, you know, you hear me say like how kind I want you to be and how loving Jesus wants you to be to your waitress and to the person in the drive through and, and to your coworkers and these people. But for this story for us begins to show us how we're supposed to love people that we're in a long-term relationship with. You know, my, your spouse, your kids, your, your in-laws, your parents, these people that, that you love throughout your life for years and decades along the way. Because I'll be honest with you, it's really easy for me to put on the, like, the face, right? And to go out into public and to love people out there. But it's more challenging to me to come in to my house where I am, where I'm supposed to be comfortable, you'll notice my house, right? This is my place. I'm going to be me, and I'm going to expect you to get in line. And it's the place where it's the most tempting to say, I want you to think like me because it's my house, right? I'm the potter familius. I'm the one who is, I'm the dad. I pay the bills here. <laughs> get off my lawn and think like me in this place, Right? And it's so easy in those long-term relationships. We go out in public, we're in a place, and it's easy to just put on, and, oh, I love you, and oh, I care about you. But then we get in with our spouse, we get in with our kids, our parents, our in-laws, these people that we're in these long-term relationships with. And, and, it's, and that frustration begins to rise. And Jesus tells us, look, this is the place that is the foundation for everything else. And if you can't figure out how to love those people, then none of the rest of the stuff's gonna matter because it doesn't have a foundation that's built with the people that you would live with day by day. Now we see in Jesus, in this story, something that we love about him and that Jesus is able to balance two things that are in tension. You know, John chapter one, we've talked about this a lot. Jesus was full of grace and truth. It's really hard to balance grace and truth, right? It's like, you know, the classic example of your wife coming and saying, you know, does this make me look fat? And you're like, oh no, I'm here in this, at this crux of grace and truth, right? Okay, oh, you know, the, the single guys in the room, you're like, what? I don't get it, you know, what's he talking about? Uh, but grace and truth are hard, right? I mean, it's hard to have hard conversations with people. It's hard to like love them enough to, to, to say and do the challenging things. But Jesus was able to hold both things in tension perfectly, grace and truth. And another thing that Jesus is able to hold in tension is tough love and gentle love. Tough love and gentle love. Jesus was able to know when to be hard and when to be compassionate and easygoing and forgiving. We see this in this story in John chapter 11, verses four through six. We read this earlier, but it says, when he heard, when Jesus heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. Well, there's a lot of story that's kind of getting ready to unfold and happen. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. That, there's a lot of pain in those verses, isn't there? And, there, the, and it, yet it says that this is love. And yet there's pain here. Like what, what Jesus just said is that Lazarus is gonna have to feel the experience of death. I mean, I've never died, but it doesn't sound pleasant, right? All right, I'm just checking in. This is just a mental health check. It doesn't sound pleasant, right? No. <laughs> Okay, Does, uh, and, and Lazarus is gonna have to experience the pain of death. Martha and Mary are gonna have to watch their brother die. In fact, there's so much pain in this verse because he's, Jesus says that the events that unfold here are gonna eventually lead to his death. How much easier it would have been had Jesus just gone and healed Lazarus. But in that moment, Jesus said, no, I love them, so I want to take them somewhere deeper. I want them to see, I want them to experience, I want them to go through this valley so that they can see what it's like to come out on the other side. Like, what kind of love is this? Uh, I think there's parts of us that would say, I'm not sure I want that kind of love that would lead me through this difficulty. But see, we can think that it's always the best thing to do to bring people through the easiest path. 
We can think that loving someone means that I always make life easy for them. It can be a child that we never allow them to cry or whine or not get what they want. It can be a spouse that we never want to be inconvenienced or feel bad about something uh, and never have any conflict. It, it, can, it, it can be our parents who we never want to disappoint them. And, and even as adults, we never set boundaries with them and we never have healthy relationships with them. You see, while giving in to what others want is sometimes easier, we cannot confuse being a pushover for being loving. We cannot consider, we cannot confuse being, oh, well, I'm just gonna do everything you want all the time. We can't confuse that for being loving because Jesus shows us in this story so clearly that sometimes there have to be boundaries. Sometimes there's going to be pain. It can be the pain of discipline with a kid. It can be the pain with a spouse of having a hard conversation that results in saying, look, we've got to change or we've got to go to counseling or we've got to do something because uh, it can't stay this way. It can be a boundary conversation with your parents and saying, listen, you know, we're married now, we have our home now, and, and now there has to be boundaries here. I love you, mom and dad, but now there needs to be boundaries. And it can be a challenge. It can, those things are difficult. But we can't confuse just being a doormat all the time. We can't confuse just being a pushover for being loving. There's tough love, and there's accommodating love. And both of those things can break other people but we have to be led by the Spirit. So that the Spirit says to us, you know what? This is a time when you need to have some tough love. Or this is a time when you need to be accommodating. You know, all of us are bent one way or the other. You know, there's some tough love people in the room, right? And you just go through life smacking everybody, you know? It's like, oh, you didn't do it exactly how, <laughs> right? And there's some people in the room and you're bent toward accommodating gentle love and it doesn't matter whatever anybody does to me. I'm okay, it's fine, it was probably for the best. But yet the Spirit of God says, and Jesus' example shows us, that we need to be led by him. And sometimes it's a time for tough love. Sometimes it's a time to stand up and set boundaries and have hard conversations. And other times it's time for grace. It's time to, to, to love in a gentle way and to say, you know what, I'm gonna let this slide. This isn't characteristic, this isn't indicative, and so I'm not gonna make a big deal out of this. There's both of those. And if you're bent one way or the other and you just live in whatever, wherever you're bent, you are not following the way of Jesus. Because Jesus says there's times for hard love. He loved them so he stayed where he was two more days. And there's times for compassion and grace. Lepers yelling at him from a distance and he says, be healed. No relationship, no, nothing there. But what do we see in the, in the relationships where Jesus has the most long-standing relationships? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were people that he had known for years. We see the evidence of the tough love stepping up in this moment and saying, listen, these are relationships where sometimes we have to go through hard things together. Now, as Jesus goes into Bethany, we begin to see something else that for me, is a core value. As a pastor, it's a core value. As a person, it's a core value. And that is that Jesus does not respond and we are called not to treat everyone the same. We have a tendency, right? Again, it's about me, it's about us, and I'm however I am, and I just walk into every relationship and I treat those people exactly how I wanna be treated and I do all the things according to how I wanna do it, but Jesus is not like that. You know, the Apostle Paul describes this process. We see it clearly in Jesus, but the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, he says, though I am free, and this is, like I'm saying, this is a core value to me. This is a core scripture for me. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Paul describes this, but we see this so evident in Jesus' life because he walks into Bethany and, and Martha comes to meet him first. And Martha gets a bad rap, right? Because Martha's in the kitchen in the earlier story and she's like, Mary, Jesus, tell Mary to come help me. And, and Jesus is like, Mary's chosen the best thing for Mary. 
and Mary needs to stay here. And so Martha gets a bad rap, but Martha is really an incredible woman, a godly woman, and I think we see that so clearly because as Jesus walks in and he sees Martha first, and you notice in these stories I'm about to tell, Martha and Mary say almost exactly the same thing to Jesus, but he responds in completely different ways. So he comes into Bethany and Martha says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Listen, for many years, I thought that Martha's response here indicated that she was hoping for a resurrection, but that's not what this verse means. This doesn't mean when when Martha says, even now I know God will give you anything you want, what Martha is saying in this moment is, you didn't do things how I wanted you to do them, but I still believe in you. I still believe in you. I mean, how mature is that faith for her to stand there? She's just gone through the pain of watching her brother die, the pain of unfulfilled. She genuinely believes that if Jesus had come and healed her brother, that he'd still be alive. But in that moment, she says, you didn't do things how I wanted you to do them, but I still believe in you. And if you've lived long enough, then you know that that is a hard prayer to pray, a hard thing to say. I love Martha. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, who is to come into the world. You know, in their day, there was a debate about the resurrection, whether the dead rose from the rose again or not, whether there was eternal life, all of those things. There was a debate about the Messiah, who he was and where he was. Martha and Jesus, in this moment, enter into a theological conversation about messiahs and resurrections and all of these things. And then Mary comes. And Mary comes to Jesus. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's exactly what Martha said, isn't it? But does Jesus enter into a theological conversation with Mary? No, John 11, 35 is every Sunday school kid's favorite memory verse. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. So with one person, Martha comes to him. Martha's a, Martha's a doer, right? She's, She's washing the dishes. She's preparing the food. She's doing all the things. She's a serious person. And when, and when Jesus interacts with her, he has a deep theological conversation about messiahs and resurrections. Mary is a feeling person. She comes in, she's, she's loving, she's sweet. And when she comes to Jesus, what does Jesus do? Jesus weeps along with her. Some of us are theological people. And so we walk into every conversation. It's like, oh, well, let me tell you the deep things of God. And some people just need you to cry with them. Some of us are criers. And so we enter in and we just cry with them. Oh, I'm just gonna cry with you. And they're like, "Uh -uh, get off me. And I need to talk about what we believe. But what do we see in Jesus? Every person that he interacts with throughout the gospels and so clearly in this story, he adjusts himself to whoever he's interacting with. And these are the people, hear me now. These are the people that he's known for years and years. These are the people that he's the closest with. I'm gonna say it again. This is the most challenging. It's easy. I can put on, I can put on the Pastor Jason, okay? And I can go out and I can be nice to people at Taco Bell and I can be nice to people at Kroger and God bless you. And then I go home. I've had a long day and I'm a little empty. And Michelle doesn't say something just how I want her to. And I snap back and my kids aren't thinking like me and being like me and I'm frustrated with them. These are the people that Jesus was the closest to. And for you, the people that you're closest to, Jesus says, listen, you need to be a student of who they are. You need to know how does your spouse need to be loved? How does your, how do your children, they're not all the same. How do they need to be loved? How do your in-laws need to be loved? How do your parents need to be loved? How are the people that you're in the long haul of life with, how do they need to be loved? I should be able to ask you that question and you should be able to tell me, look, this is their love language. This is their personality. This is who they are. This is what they like. This is how they like to be communicated with. This is how they, they like to be loved. Each and every person. This is the call on us from God is that we're to be students of those people. And I wanna tell you, there's nothing I don't think harder in life than this because it's in my house. It's every day. 
See, my faith hard. It's hard every single day to love. And we read these scriptures sometimes and we think, you know, Paul is writing and he's writing, he's a first century missionary in a foreign land that's hostile to him. And he writes these scriptures. But I don't think these scriptures are just for first century missionaries. I think when Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4 that he's talking to all of us. And he says this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. It takes the power of God to love these people, to love the people in our lives this way. Paul says, we are hard pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Is it that? I mean, don't you read that and you think, oh, well, that's for a far off land. Oh, that's for out and that's for trying to get people saved out there, somebody else. But no, it's us at home. It's us, even in the comfort of our own home, dying to ourself and showing love and life to the people that are around us. I've studied them, I know them, I know how they need to be loved. And I'm gonna need the strength of God because of this jar of clay. If I'm gonna love them like that every single day, I'm gonna feel crushed, it's gonna feel heavy. I'm gonna need God, I'm gonna need His Spirit. So we have our love goal tracker on our watch. You know, my watch tells me how many steps I walked today, tells me how much I stood up. That's why I pace back and forth here so at the end of the day, my step counts higher. <laughs> but what if my watch told me how much I loved people today? What percentage of the day did I connect with the Spirit for the right balance of tough love and gentle love? Or did I just do what comes naturally to me? Did I walk into every situation and the Holy Spirit was leading me? Does somebody need a hard conversation, but I'm not a hard conversation kind of person? Did somebody need me to show compassion to them, but I'm not a compassion kind of person? How many of those situations was I led by the Spirit? What what does my wife say at the end of the day? What percentage of the people that I encountered today did I love according to their way of needing loved? And again, we've had this conversation over these last few weeks and we've thought about people at Kroger and we've thought about people out there and by all means, please love others. But what about the people that we live with? We see every day, did I love them this morning the way they needed to be loved? Will I love them this afternoon as I make it to the end of the day? What percentage of my interactions with those people closest to me those people where I'm so tempted to just let go and just be myself, how many of those people did I love them how they needed to be loved? Let's pray together. God, we need you. We desire to love people how you loved people. We desire to be the people that you've called us to be. But Lord, it's hard. God, we have to be reshaped by your spirit. We have to be strengthened by your spirit. We have to be directed by your spirit. God, not just occasionally, but always. Teach us to surrender our lives to you. Teach us, God, how to have this type of love in our lives. God, even as we conceptualize it, it's challenging. But Lord, we see it. We know it's your way. God, these are the people I care about the most. Would it not make sense that I would invest in them and love them the way they need to be loved? But God, it's still so hard. So help us. We need you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Let's stand together. Our prayer team is coming this morning. And even as we prepare to go, if you have a need that you need to pray about, maybe you've got an appointment coming up. Maybe you have a loved one who doesn't know the Lord. Maybe you need healing in your body. And even as everyone makes their way out the door here in just a second, maybe you have some work that you need to do with the Lord. These people would love to pray with you and agree with you in prayer. There's power in agreement. So don't just, don't just make a beeline out every week just because that's what you do. If you've got something on your heart this morning, why not take a minute, pray with someone. 
God, I pray your blessing on your people as they go from this place. God, would you give them peace that passes understanding? Lord, peace that saturates even their homes as you guide them and lead them. Lord, as people around them take notice and they come and they say, what's different about you? Our answer will be, it's Jesus. He's changing me. He's bringing to my heart and my mind the ways I need to be moment by moment. And I'm able to be grounded. I'm able to have peace. Lord, I thank you for this blessing and I pray this peace.